Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Perspective with me, Julie Ali. And as I was preparing for this particular show, what crossed my mind is in the recent past, I have in fact been interviewing lots of authors and each of them came from a very different perspective and a different background, talking about different books, what um, inspired them to write the books and the stories that they are sharing by way of the books that they've written. This time around, I have an equally inspiring young lady in studio with me. I think she's awesome, and I'm going to introduce her to you in a minute or two, but I just want to tell you a little bit about the book she's written. It's called Celebrating Our Differences, Embracing My Superpowers. It's a book curated for children who are differently abled. And I think that is absolutely awesome. So let's get talking with this amazing young lady. She is Nkateko Emily Mabasa. I got the name right and I'm quite pleased about that. A very good morning to you, welcome. Thank you so much, good morning. Lovely to have you here and you relax sitting down, walked yourself into the studio, <laughs> your crutches are next to you. Uh, but as you made your way into the studio as well, I noticed how very independent you are. And for that, I salute you. Thank you. It must have been quite a journey for you. Uh, you've gone on and uh, I also have to share this with our viewers. And that is, uh, you've written this book but you're also a Golden Award holder for the Duke of Edinburgh International Award. You're a public speaker and founder of Phoenix Alexandra. Uh, so let's start right at the beginning. What was your childhood like? Because I know that children in their innocence can be very cruel. Um, if you are differently abled, they tend to marginalize you. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, did you grow up with being very lonely, being marginalized all the time? And what did you keep telling yourself when people pushed you aside? I've been very blessed with uh, my family, you know, because that's where it had to start. My cousins and everybody um, letting me know you are different, but we're not going to treat you differently. So from home, I've never been treated differently. When I started school, it was a um, school w which had children who are differently abled and children that weren't differently abled because I wanted to interact with everyone. And um, I will say at the beginning, yes, there was a bit of a confidence um, matter with myself, you know, not understanding why I'm different. But however, over the years, I've come to understand that that's my superpower and that's what makes me special. And I won't say that I had a bad childhood. I had a really good childhood because of the support system that I come from and also the way I'm able to make friends because of my own disability. Yes. And your confidence, obviously. You're good in your own skin, aren't you? You're comfortable in your skin. Talk to us about your disability. What exactly... Uh, what is the disability that you are afflicted with and how has it impacted uh, in your life over the years? Thank you for that question. Um, I've been diagnosed with cerebral palsy and it has different um, forms of cerebral palsy. There's four that I currently know of myself and mine is uh, diaplegia, mild, meaning that um, at some point in my life I could not speak. I could not walk. So actually walking into studio is such an achievement for me because I used to be in a wheelchair. And um, for so long the doctors had said, this is going to you be your best friend, the, referring to the wheelchair. And I said, no, I refused to let that be the story that they wrote about my life. And I decided to push myself to the point where I'm actually now using crutches. Wow. How long is it that you're out of the wheelchair? Sure. If Mats doesn't fail me, I think I've been using crutches since I was 12. So now I'm 33. So it's been a long time. Yes. Wow. When you were growing up and uh, you were told that you have this disability, and I know that you have indicated you come from a very supportive, loving family, did you ever question 
or point fingers or ask your mother, why me? I have to be honest, I did. I, you know, being a teenager, you confused with all the other things, puberty and all of that. And I was angry at some point. And I had to kind of realize that nobody was at fault and me carrying on being angry wasn't going to help me either. So um, that's when I started my journey of accepting who I was. And from there, it's been such a beautiful journey, realizing that actually accepting who I am as a whole and understanding that even though I might not look like everybody else, um, that is my superpower. Acceptance uh, is a lot of hard work. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Let's understand the type of self-talk that went on in your mind about the acceptance of your situation. Okay, it, it had to start way back when um, I, f I had my first operation, which was at the age of seven. And then the doctors had said, okay, um, this is going to be your life and whatever. And I said to them, but I want to learn to, like, how to walk, just like my siblings, because I'm the youngest of my siblings. And they said to me, but it's impossible. And I said, let's try. So it started there with me wanting to try and my family supporting me. And when I turned around 12 years old, um, the doctors had said, I'm, I'm scheduled for a, another operation. And I said, no, and my parents supported me. And I realized, actually, my words hold power. The things that I say about myself are important. And therefore, if my parents are able to support me and listen to what I want, I can change this whole narrative or perspective of what the doctors think my life will be like, yes. Was that a good move, not undergoing that operation at the age of 12? Had you had the operation, how do you believe your physical condition would have been different? Yes, I'm so grateful that I did have that bravery at that age to say no, because I do have friends that have the same or similar condition and they were scheduled for second operations, which they have gone for, and some have turned out worse, and some are not the same in terms of mentally because it shifts a lot of things. And I'm so grateful that I only relied on my faith and belief that I'm going to rewrite what the doctors have already pre-written about me, yes. At the tender age of 12, yes. you had the firm belief that you can change your destiny. Yes. Where does that deep spirituality come from? It has to come from, you know, I, I, I so believe that my parents and my family just instilled all of this, you know, faith and, and, and belief in me before, long before I believed in myself. And um, I'm a Christian, so that's where it happened. And um, understanding that he had a bigger purpose for me and understanding that even though I might not know what is happening, I need to just trust the process. And I think with that understanding, that's why things have turned out so great. Wonderful. What do you believe is your bigger purpose? I mean, we're going to get to the bo a book in a <laughs> short while because I think that is huge in itself. But what do you believe is your purpose in life? That's a beautiful question. Um, I believe that my purpose in life is to be the voice of people that cannot speak for themselves. And also just to show people that in our differences, there's so much beauty. We don't have to judge. We don't have to you know, put people in boxes because Growing up, I was told I need to act a certain way. You know, told, you're too loud, you're too this, you're too that. And, and if I had let them dim my light, I wouldn't be where I am today. You know, I said, okay, you think my light is too bright? That's your problem, it's not my problem. You have to just deal with it yourself. So I think if people start realizing that we are all different and just because you don't understand why the other person is acting the certain way, you should just be kind, is what I want people to remember, kindness and understanding. We are going for our first ad break, and when we do come back, I want to talk 
some more about some of the challenges and some of the bad, difficult, awkward situations in your life. And then we'll go on to the book and all of your amazing awards. You are an amazing woman. I am really pleased to have you in studio with me today. Her Thank name you for is Emily Mabaso. She's written this book. I'm going to hold it up to the cameras. And undoubtedly throughout this interview, we will have the book flashing on screen. So please go out, buy the book. And even if you don't have a disabled person in your family, just begin to understand the journey of a person who is differently abled. Stay with us. This is Perspective with me, Julie Ali. I have an amazing young woman in studio with me. She is the type of person who really is an inspiration. If you're down and out and in a very dark hole or a dark corner, this is the story you need to listen to because it will give you hope. It will make you pick yourself up and forge ahead. The wind's name is Emily Mabaso. She's 33 years old. She's written a book called Celebrating Our Differences, Embracing My Superpowers. She has been in a wheelchair in the early years of her life. And over the past, um, I think from the age of 12 up to now at 33, she's been using crutches much against doctor's advice, um, she's proven them wrong. So you see, sometimes we need to listen to our inner voice. And that's exactly what you did. Yes. And you're pleased about it. I'm very pleased because now, as much as the world is not accessible, because, you know, um, there's a lot of stairs and there's um, not enough intuitivity in this world that we live in. But I can still access buildings because I believe that I needed to give myself a chance. And being on crutches allows me to go on stairs, you know, use stairs and, and, and not rely so much on, on lifts and other people to assist me a lot of the times. During uh, the meeting I had just before the show started and even during the course of the interview, I picked up, you thanked me for asking one or two questions. Um, and I just wanted to know, when I pose those questions to you, I wanted to know if you're okay that I go down that route. And you actually thanked me. So what are the type of things, uh, you know, the do's and the don'ts you want people to observe when they're interacting with you? I offered to help you and you said, thank you for offering, but I can manage. Does it offend you from time to time? Or are you okay when people try to rush to your assistance? Does it make you feel more helpless when they do that? Thank you so much for that question. It's very important. Um, for me, I'd prefer for you to communicate with me, to ask me before doing anything. I've had people in the past, you know, I, I carry bags and a school bag or something, and it looks like I'm struggling, but I'm okay, you know. So they would, you know, grab my belongings and say, I'm helping you. And then I feel offended because how dare they come into my personal space without asking if that's okay. So the, the most important thing, and I think for any person living with any difference or that is not like the average Joe, is to just ask them and have a com conversation. Because by asking, you are showing that you are acknowledging that they're in the room. But by you just grabbing their belongings, it's like you don't care about their own feelings and you want to do good. I understand people want to help. I understand you want to be kind, but there's a way you can approach it and not by intim intimidating me. Because sometimes, these people are big in size and, you know, <laughs> I'm petite and I'm like, is this person going to hurt me? Now I'm thinking about safety hazards. I'm no longer thinking you're helping me because now I'm thinking, are you robbing me? What's happening? So if you speak to me first, then I'm more at ease at saying yes or no. And also I would like people to respect if I do say no for them to say okay and then they step back. You seem like a very independent young lady. Uh, today you have uh, someone from the publishing company 
and the publishing company obviously is Lingua Franca. Yes. He's here, um, I suppose, just to kind of see that everything runs smoothly, and rightly so, because we are promoting the book that they have been involved in publishing. But what comes to mind for me, he's not here as a caretaker, he's just here to see that things does actually move along smoothly. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who had a disabled child, and in conversation she said to me, what broke her heart many a times was when they went out in public, it was almost as if this disabled child in a wheelchair was invisible. People wouldn't interact with the child. They talk over him mm -hmm. and refer all the questions to the parent. So the parent had to almost be the intermediary, which I believe in his situation, he was a, a university graduate, very intelligent and very independent in his own right. But people took that power away from him. Do you find that that happens a lot to you? And when it does happen, how do you respond? Yes, it happens a lot, you know, especially when I'm with my mom, because we look alike. I, I go everywhere with my mom, my dad, and my siblings and so forth. And people would, like in the restaurant, for example, would ask my mom, what would she like to eat? And I'm thinking, my mom doesn't know what I want to eat. So I would kindly then say to the waitress, no, please ask me. You can speak to me, I can hear you, I can respond. Uh, don't, don't, don't overlook my existence. Don't act like I'm not here, please you know, speak to me. And sometimes they feel really bad about doing that, but that was never my intention to make them feel bad. It's just to tell them that it's not okay to ask somebody else what I would like when I'm in the room. So it happens a lot, but um, I do also understand that it's because not a lot of people are exposed to people with disabilities and they actually don't know how to act. Absolutely. So that is also not their fault. So it's a, it's a learning curve for both of us, myself and them, whether I'm going to react with anger or kindness and for them to take it as a learning experience or however, but for me, it took me a while to understand not everybody has the exposure to people with disabilities. Absolutely. Let's talk about your schooling years and what you did thereafter mm -hmm. to get to this point in your life. Okay, I went to a school called Forest Town School where, it, it, like I explained earlier, it was both uh, children with disabilities and children without disabilities because that's always been my my desire to be interacting with everybody. And my parents listened to me yet again and they allowed me to go through that. And then I matriculated, then I went to UJ to study fashion design. So I'm wow. actually a fashion designer. The reason for that is because I couldn't find clothes that fit because of it's hard to put on clothes um, if they tailored a certain way. So I had to learn how to do that myself as a form of showing support to um, myself and relying more on myself. And basically, I'm so grateful to the teachers that were, I mean, the lectures at the university, because most of the times I would have to, you know, struggle with using the machine. But I found new ways of actually navigating um, how to sew and do things. So basically, it's been a um, learning, you know, journey for myself using education and also teaching other people how I learn, yeah. It's a far cry. You took up a fashion designing at UJ and here you are sitting in studio with me talking about uh, this amazing book you've written, celebrating our differences, embracing my superpowers and this is targeted at children. Uh, what age group have you um, actually targeted in this book? Okay, I would like to go as low as I can, so four years old upwards, because, you know, f at four they, they can talk, you know, they're learning how to read, and the sooner the better for me, because what I do understand is when kids are exposed they are most likely to be more understanding and more curious because I want kids to be curious, ask the questions, 
like I said to you earlier, you're asking the right questions. <laughs> I actually want people to start asking the right questions and not asking questions that are going to be offensive or questions that actually are not even supposed to be asked because they're just obvious. Like, um, I used to use public transport as well at some point, and I sat in the front seat and somebody asked me, can you count change? That was offensive Ooh. because... <laughs> what are you trying to say? Are you saying I'm not able to use my brain? So with this book, I'm hoping that it allows kids to have healthy um, conversation with other children that are possibly living with disabilities, and then we, we grow from there. Okay, are you planning on getting these books into all schools in the country? Because this book doesn't only belong in a school that has children with uh, disabilities. Because if we can get this book into schools throughout South Africa, I think people will grow up being very respectful to people who are different to them. And that we will be paying it forward by so doing. Uh, and I suppose this you'll have to pass by your publishers as well. Um, they are sitting in the room, so maybe they can take it back to the boardroom and see if this is doable. Yes. But having said that, let's just go back to my first question. Studying, you studied fashion design, and here you are having published <laughs> your first book. Yes. That's, that's, that's a very big uh, difference. Mm. It's, it's two totally different worlds. But before you respond to that, we need to go for our next, um, our next ad break. So when we come back, hold that thought and you can res respond to me thereafter. This amazing young woman is Emily Mabaso. She's written the book, Celebrating Our Differences, Embracing My Superpowers, targeted at school children. But you know what? I've just skimmed through the book. It's not only for school kids. It's lessons for you and I as well. So when we go out into the world and we come across a person with a disability, this book will teach us how to interact with them in a very respectful manner. So please go out, buy the book, support a worthy cause, and get yourself knowledgeable in the process as well. Don't go away. We still have two more segments with the amazing Emily Mabasa. Celebrating Our Differences, Embracing My Superpowers is a book written by this amazing guest I have in studio with me this morning. She's talking about um, embracing, embracing disabilities, um, you know, empowering yourself, understand, educate yourself about differences so that we can live in a more cohesive world. So let's talk about, uh, you know, how you then navigated or found yourself in the space of writing a book on disabilities for children. Okay, so the journey had to, I think, if I think about it, had to start when I was very young because, um, like I mentioned earlier, I couldn't speak clearly oh. to go through a speech yeah. therapy. And they uh, said to me, another way for you to actually be more confident in your speaking would be books. So I have a good relationships with a lot of books. I read a lot. I'm a reader. I'm a lover of books. And that's how it started. And then I started using my own life experiences to motivate, which I started when I was 16 at school and so forth. And I used to, like, I'm also, I am very good at writing my feelings and understanding. So... Um, when my publisher came and approached me, you know, and said to me, we, we love your energy, we love the person that you are and what you represent, can you please work with us? I had to say yes. You know? Okay, they heard you on another radio show. Yes. And they decided to do this a collaborative effort with you to write this book. Yes. Uh, did they kind of give you a concept? almost like a draft to say, this is where we'd like you to go along with this book? Or do they talk about your life experiences, hear what you're about and say, I think this way we can really put together a story that goes straight to the heart? Okay, what I love about Lingua Franca publishers is that when they said, please can we work with you because we love the person and what you represent, uh, we had our first meeting and they listened to my story and I told them, and they said to me, uh, please give us three concepts and 
out of those three concepts, we will then choose which one we will publish or we will go with. And um, I had to now go back and think, okay, what are the things that I struggled with? How did I overcome those struggles as a young person um, in my younger years? And I then I called them to say, I'm ready now to pitch. And I pitched all three you know, different stories. And to my surprise, they came back and said, we love all three, wow. so you're going to have to write three stories. And that's how it actually happened. So is this the first one, Celebrating Our Differences, Embracing My Superpowers? Are you saying there are two more books in the pipeline? No, there's actually, all of the concepts are in this book. Okay, all three are in the book. Yes. Wow. It must have been quite a learning curve for you, sitting here saying, I'm an author. I'm an author of a book that's making a huge difference in people's lives. How does it make you feel? I can't get over it. It's been such a surreal feeling because, like I said, I, I read books. And have I ever thought that I would actually write a book? Yes, maybe, but not really thinking that it would be a possibility. So this for me is a beautiful gift to myself wow. and to my younger self to say, you know what, all that reading paid off because look, now you can say you're an author, you can add it to your bio and tell people and introduce yourself like that, which is a big thing because literature is forever. Absolutely. Uh, are you still involved in the fashion industry, in the uh, design industry? Um, here and there, I design things for myself, but I haven't really, you know, used uh, my degree to that extent. Because then I found interest in other things. It's it's so it's so crazy how, you know, I studied one thing and then I ended up doing other things. But I'm still so grateful that I was able to go through that process of studying fashion design because it's taught me so much about my own body and how what fits me and what doesn't fit me. So yeah. How much of time did this book, you know, how much of your life did it take <laughs> up? And now that it's behind you, what's the way forward for you? And please do tell me that the sales are going very, very well. I'm hoping <laughs> the sales are going very well. I'm hoping people, are, because people are excited about the book and people are reaching out to say, no, we actually are excited. We're glad you wrote this book. Um, I'm hoping they're buying it now. Um, but the process, it, 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 when I spoke to my publisher, it was like I had deadlines. And mind you, I hate deadlines, so I always used to do it before <laughs> because then my nerves are you know, a bit calm when I know I've already submitted and everything. So the, the whole process took almost a year because we wanted it to come out or be published by the time we are now celebrating Disability Awareness, uh, Disability Right Awareness Month. And that's exactly what happened. So we kept to our schedule. And were you happy with the illustrations? Were you involved in every step of the way? Because the book is beautifully illustrated. I love the illustrations and the colors that they've got in here <gasps> and the different stories. It's gorgeous. Were you involved in this concept as well? Or were you kind of, did they show it to you and you agreed that um, you think they're on the right track? OK, um, like I said, you know, they were very, um, my publisher was very, um, happy to always ask, is this okay? Is this, you know, wow. how, how, how would you like to see this? So um, I hadn't met the illustrator, but I had given them at least a picture of what I want the characters to look like. So I drew, you know, what I would like. But however, they were very considerate to making it show representation because that's what I actually wanted. And they are very beautiful. I'm actually so happy. When I first saw it, that's the only thing, because I know the story that I wrote. So I was like, not even worried about the editing part. I just <laughs> wanted to see the illustrations, and I'm so happy with how it came out, because it's so much diversity. It's beautifully illustrated. I'm loving it, uh, I might add. And like you've said, diversity is the key here as well. So you've moved along, and uh, let's talk about the, du the Duke of Edinburgh International Award. Was this pre or post the book? Um, it was before the book, long before the book. 
I started with that, um, the Duke of Edinburgh International Award, also known as the President's Award in South Africa, in 2018 when I was actually in my matric year. So um, what you need to do is community service. You need to learn um, how to do a new skill. And that skill that I learned was writing and um, other skills as well. You also have to learn, um, um, you also have to go on an adventurous journey. So you're camping, you know how to put up a tent, hikes, and that's how it all started. And the other component of this um, amazing award is that you, you have to, you know, um, give give back to people, and that's what I loved about it. And I I was with them for five years as a participant, and now I just volunteer because um, I love what they stand for. And yeah, and then at the end you get this big celebration of you um, completing it. So there's the bronze, the silver, and the gold. So I've done all three levels. And the most challenging um, segment of all this, um, of the award was doing the adventurous journey, you know, going on hikes. The last one I had to do 80 kilometer hike. Ooh. And one of my crutches broke. Oh, and then I, I had to decide, do I go back? <laughs> And at least I've done half. Or do I go forward and find a way to make it? So I had to crawl. So my poor knees. But I actually made the AT. And that's one of the things I'm always going to be proud of. And speaking of that, you know what? Even though I had a stumbling block, I looked over that. And I found a new way of traveling. <laughs> that's absolutely remarkable. How long did the program actually run for? How often did you have to attend the program? And where was it? So the program is not a set place. It can be done at schools, at juvenile prisons with young offenders, which is what is so beautiful about it. So what happens is that you are given stipulated months to complete. So with me, I had other things. I had school. So you have to learn how to be... Honest, integrity is what it teaches you the most. So um, in all of this, you need to make sure that you've completed the hours that they've given you in the stipulated months. For me, it took me longer, obviously, because of my own difference, but also because I wanted to be honest about me completing it to the full and not just writing in there that I did 40 hours of service when I actually didn't do it. So... Um, it's basically them reaching out to the organization and say, we want to actually try this with our kids or whoever, and then they'll come to you, introduce the program, and then you'll get started. So it's a beautiful thing because it's also um, involved in other countries, 121 countries, if I'm correct. And I guess the program is all about self-empowerment and being true to yourself, mm. is it not? Okay, let's go for our next ad break. And when we come back, we're going to dig deep into this book. So let's ask our viewers to please stay with us. We've got lots more to cover on the show this morning. <laughs> Welcome back. We're into the final segment of the show this morning with this amazing young woman, Emily Mabasa. And uh, she's written this book called Celebrating Our Differences, Embracing Our Superpowers. It is published by Lingua Franca Publishers. Can you tell us a little bit about these publishers? You've had this long relationship with them. And for people watching us this morning thinking, they're the people I need to go to because I am writing this amazing book. What are they all about? They are a um, black-owned company, which um, they, they want to bring back the culture of reading in young kids, you know, the love of reading. And it's what we struggle with, you know, with kids having devices, actually don't want to read anymore an actual book. So that's what they stand for. They, they, they also want um, young kids to understand that by consuming literature, they can empower themselves. So it's all about empowerment. And they are very considerate. They they take into consideration what you actually prefer. They don't impose, even though they're the professional in the field, because this is my first book. Sure. I know nothing about publishing a book, but yet they guided me and they were there for me to say, look, 
you know, we think this would work, um, but we are also here to listen to your own opinions. So not not a very pushy relationship. It's a very kind and very gentle relationship that I've um, built with them. A two-way relationship. Yes. Uh, do they, Lingua Franca, do they actually only specialise in kiddies' children's books or is it books right across the board? They, they've also published other books, not just children's books, but that's their main focus, and also educational books, you know, for your, for your departments and so forth. So people can go onto their website to find out more about them, and they're always um, looking for people with interesting stories wow. to approach them. So let people who feel their stories are worth telling approach them, and let's see what that does for them as well. Okay, so the comment I made earlier on that they approached the Department of Education and get these books in all the schools wasn't very far off, was it? No, it was. <laughs> because they specialise in educational books. Having said that, let's talk a little bit about the book. We do want people to go out and buy the book, but what is a parent and a child going to get out of this book in terms of are there activities? What sort of lessons is the child going to walk away with? Reading the book, is the child going to be aware of what? Okay, so uh, beautiful question, right? So the, the children are going to learn about three different types of disabilities. We have 21 in South Africa, so this one at least gives them a light on three different types that we have that is spoken about in the book with three different characters, they're going to learn how to set healthy boundaries. And I think also adults struggle with this, you know, setting those healthy boundaries and not feeling guilty and not feeling bad about it. We all need to learn that skill. It's a beautiful skill that we all need to learn. And then they're going to learn about not dimming their light and letting themselves shine through regardless of what others have said about them. And that's one of the other characters she speaks about confidence and regaining her confidence. And the other one also speaks about fighting for others, you know, uh, being an advocate for other people and saying no to discrimination. Because I think a lot of the times you we are put into rooms and uncomfortable things happen and we all decide to keep quiet. But we need that one person to say, no, this is not right. You know, and that's what they will learn to speak up when things are not correct and are not properly done. So I believe that's what the children are going to learn. Is there a next book in the pipeline with Emily Mabasa and Lingua Franca? And what will that story look like? I'd love to write another book because the, 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 the journey was pleasant. It was a learning curve for me. I had to really dig deep inside myself. Um, we'll see. I hope, yeah, I hope my publisher's listening so we can, <laughs> we can see how we can do that. But let's see how, also how people perceive or receive the book. That's why we need them to go buy it so that, you know, we can get another set of books out if possible, yes. Let's talk about the Phoenix Foundation, Phoenix Alexandra. You come from the township of Alexandra, which is yes. literally around the corner from the studios. What is the foundation all about? So the foundation is all about creating a, a society that is inclusive, that helps kids understand their own abilities. So I use dancing. One thing that I didn't mention is also I'm a dancer. So, you know, I teach them dancing. I teach them the love of reading because we have a reading club and acting. So they will write down scripts and then they will act out. So like some of the dramas are speaking about, don't have discrimination against other kids. So I use art as a form of um, teaching them life lessons through the foundation. And it's been such a beautiful journey because I started straight after I had actually lost my corporate job in 2020. You lost your corporate job? Yes. Were you fired or did you decide to walk away? Uh, I was retrenched because of COVID. Ah, you know, I was okay. one of the people like, you are, they, they decided that for me. They're like, you are going to be in more danger because you've got a disability. They thought I was going to be um, contracted first. And I didn't contract it at all. Thank God for what that. What was your co uh, corporate job? What were you doing there? Okay, I was a quality assurance analyst. So, you know, the people that listen to calls, you know, this call is recorded, all of that. 
I'm one of those people that okay. listens to those calls and make sure that what you are told as the client is correct to what the company is offering. So I am fluent in about seven South African languages. Wow. And that's why I took up that job because it needs you to be fluent in a lot of the languages. How did you feel about being asked to, uh, t you know, to step down? And now that it's post-COVID, any ideas or any thoughts about going back into corporate? Or have you made a totally different space for yourself? I've made such a total different space for myself. I'm, I, I totally love the fact that I started Phoenix in the, in the, the midst of all that that I was going through. And I cannot see my life without it now. You know, the kids that come to me and learn so much. I learn so much from them. And me going back into a corporate space would only mean that I have to give that up. And I wouldn't have had the chance to actually write the book because, you know, working um, for yourself or doing other things outside of corporate gives you more free time. And that's what I've gained. And I would not give that up. So I'm actually glad they let me go in a way I didn't understand then, but now I understand. It was a blessing in disguise, yes. was it not? <laughs> so um, Phoenix Alexandra is an NPO. Yes. Does that also mean it operates 24-7? Um, so we do have operating hours from 8 to 5 during the week and from 9 to 3 uh, on a Saturday. On Sunday, we don't operate unless they have to go out and perform. Because remember I said I teach them how to dance, so we need to get them performances and for them to be exposed to different places. You know, most of the kids are from Alex and they've never been outside of Alex. So this one time I took them to Pretoria and that was such an experience for them. I got so emotional because I never thought just taking somebody to Pretoria would actually change their life. So yeah, that's basically so, why I do it. Undoubtedly, lots of work ahead of you. Um, touching lives in a positive way, making a difference in these little kids' lives. How many children do you take through at the foundation at Phoenix? Do they stay with you for long periods? Do they come in regularly? And what are the age groups that you cater for? Okay, the age groups are from, well, I have a four-year-old because she's like, I want to join. I'm not going to wait until I'm six, but it's actually from six to 17 and young adults. They, um, most of them go to school. And if they don't go to school, we try to get them into a school so that they get their education because education is important. And then they come to me after school so that they are safe because most of the parents work until like the late evening hours and so forth. So um, and then we get to do all these activities with them and then they go home. Uh, we don't have kids that actually stay with us. But however, we do have kids that are orphans that live with their grandparents. But however, it's been such a beautiful journey otherwise. How many kids do you accommodate at any given time? Um, at the moment, I have 22 that are permanent. And then the others just come during school holidays. So all in all, it's 40 kids that we cater for at the moment. And you provide snacks? Yes, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, you're not going to believe this, but we have two minutes to wrap up time very quickly. Uh, where to from here for Emily Mabasa and your thoughts on gender-based violence? My thoughts on gender-based violence, it's not very good. You know, both ways, you know, whether it's a woman abusing a man or a, a man abusing a woman, it shouldn't be like that because we should show each other love and kindness. Um, basically, for me, going forward, I'm open to whatever the universe wants me to do. I'm not about to say no to anything anytime soon. So, yeah, that's Please all. Please, God, yes. Uh, just in closing, I'd like to mention something. Would you agree with the uh, thinking that uh, people with disabilities are soft targets regarding GBV issues? Yes, actually. That's why I mentioned earlier, when somebody just comes up to me without having the discussion, whether they come in to help me, my first thought is, are they coming to harm me? And I have to react a certain way. So we are a, an easier target, but hopefully... By the grace of God, um, we are protected. May God always be with you. Thank you indeed for your thoughts, sharing your life story with us here on Perspective on Hilal TV. And uh, may you always be under the care of uh, Almighty God. That's where we leave it. Thank you indeed for watching. A shout out 
to our production team. That's you, Darren and Omar. Lovely being in the studio yet again. And till the next time, as always, stay safe. And assalamu alaikum from me, Julie Ali. Thank you.